Today on Hearts of Heroes, a flash flood sweeps a family down a rushing river. Uh -oh. We know something intense is happening and something scary. Oh, no. With no official help in sight, complete strangers jump into the rescue. He's got my belt. Is he closer? Guys, it's gonna be okay. That's what I call a true hero. Plus, a 160-year-old church goes up in flames. So I pulled up on the scene. I saw a heavy fire in the rear of the church. When a disaster like a flash flood hits, we depend on our first responders to come to the rescue. But sometimes, there's no time to wait for the pros to arrive. And in situations like that, it can turn out that the hero becomes an everyday person who happens to just be right there. So for one family in Pennsylvania, their heroes actually turned out to be complete strangers. Just outside of Philadelphia sits the picturesque farmlands of Chester County, Pennsylvania. Known for rolling hills and quiet country roads, it's the kind of place where families live for generations. It's beautiful. We have a farm in our family. It's been there 200 something years, and it's still that relaxed, kind of old feel to the community and you know, one another. One of the reasons I love Chester County and um, still here uh, my whole life is it has a mix of everything, and we're a rock throw from Philadelphia. And then you have the other side of Chester County, which is, is all farmlands. But that peaceful country living was recently rocked. I have to say, over the years, storms have been getting stronger and stronger in our region. We didn't normally get hurricanes or tropical storms. It seems to be the general consensus within the community that we're getting more storms more frequently and more harsh. In August of 2020, much of the East Coast, including Chester County, was in the path of tropical storm Isaias, and that meant plenty of rain. And they're calling for heavy winds and a lot of water. The morning of the storm, Dan D. Gregorio had some business appointments in town. To be safe, he took his new SUV. And uh, I thought, why don't I take that out? It's four wheel drive. You know, it's a little windy out, a little rainy. But as Dan was out on the road, it got ugly fast. That's when the storm started picking up, and I kind of realized how bad it really started to get. I said to myself, do I take the highways and get to my next appointment, or do I take the back roads? And I chose to take the back roads. Those back roads proved to be more than a bit treacherous. Going over a bridge on the back road, I started to notice it was a lot scarier than I realized to the point where I crossed a bridge and I literally watched a creek that was now a full-blown river almost overtake the bridge as I crossed it. And soon as I crossed, an actual tree fell down just missing my rear bumper. This is actually uh, getting a little scary now. It's extremely important not to take chances in a heavy storm. These weather events can change in a heartbeat, putting your safety in danger. The covered bridge looks like it's about to be taken out. As Dan made his way down the road, he found himself stuck in a line of cars surrounded by flooding rapids. We were actually stuck on what I call Mother Nature's Island. Any path I tried to get off that island was completely engulfed in river. I knew I'm gonna be here for hours waiting for this creek to subside. David McDonald was in the car ahead of Dan and when he saw how severe the flooding was, he took out his phone and started recording. I thought it was the highest I've seen it personally. And uh, so I took note to that. And I just thought, wow, th this is really, really something. On the other side of the flooded road, Dazzo Dua was in a car with his 12-year-old brother and three small children. He watched as a few cars ahead of him made the trek across that flooded road. Dazzo then followed behind them. Driving through the water, at first everything was OK. I made it up to the middle of the water. And that's when I noticed that it's left the ground and was floating over the water. Dazzo's car was swept up in the current and slammed against a fence. He and his family were now in the middle of a raging river with no way to escape. Uh -oh. Dan and David just watched in shock from the other side of the floodway. 
So I'm just sitting there thinking, I can't believe I'm saying this. We immediately went into crisis mode. So David called 911. Dan and David tried to wade out to the stranded family, but it was no use. Started wait, walking into the water, you know, kind of ridiculous, because there's no way. It's like a half a mile. The water was just intense, and there was no way we could get there. Coming up, with options running out, Dan and David would need a miracle. Call it an act of God, call it whatever you want. We turn around, and there's a front end loader that just pulled up. And later, an historic landmark is threatened by a huge fire. I could see the fire coming through the roof at the rear of the church. But first, the safety tip. It's only human to sometimes act without one's total safety in mind. But always remember, your safety is your responsibility. Always pay attention to your surroundings. Roadway safety warnings and procedures are put forth to help keep you safe. And always ask yourself, is this truly the safest path? Because if not, maybe it's not the right thing to do. On August 4th, 2020, tropical storm Isaias blew through Chester County, Pennsylvania. The downpours were the worst part. They washed out roads and bridges, and Dazzo Dua and his family were driving home when their car was swept into the torrential floodwater. It's almost surreal. I see this car, like you see on TV, floating, floating away. And it's like, that's not good. And he continued to float. If you're unsure how deep something is, turn around, don't drown. Don't, don't take the chance. You know, you're probably talking close to six inches or so to be able to actually get your car to start to float away and leave the roadway. Out in the rushing water, Dazzo felt like his only hope was to try to carry each of the small children to safety. I told my little brother, well, nothing we can do but to try to get out of this car and try to save everybody one by one. Dazzo was now out in the rushing water, holding tight to his son, just a toddler, unable to fight the rushing current. The only thing everyone else could do was watch helplessly. You could see on the other side, people pulled over with hands in the air waving, covering their, their mouths. So we know something intense is happening and something scary. Just then, something incredible happened. Call it an act of God, call it whatever you want, a miracle. We turn around and there's a front end loader that just pulled up. The operator was stopped and we say, you know, we have a car off the road down behind those trees there somewhere. And then it's simultaneously, Dan and I both said, all right, we're going to get in the bucket. We're going to get out and check it out. The men jumped into the tractor bucket and the front end loader made its way out to Dazzo and his frightened family. And then we started to see the car and Dazzo was coming out of the car with his youngest baby. And the closer we got, we saw the gravity of the whole situation. The water was getting deeper and deeper, even for this big payloader. Hold on, hold on to that kid. The men knew that the first thing they had to do was get the toddler out of the raging water. He's got my belt. Is he closer? We quickly grabbed his son and put him into the bucket, and we put him behind us. I climb onto the car. Dazzo managed to get the two other small children onto the roof of the car. Slowly climb on the roof, slowly. But as his 12-year-old brother got out of the vehicle, he started to get swept away by the current. Stand up straight, stand up straight. He reached out with his left hand and he slipped. And I kind of, with everyone holding on to me, dove head first and some kind of luck. Caught him by both wrists and his feet were not even touching anymore because of how strong the water was. I just held on as hard as I could and we were able to all together muscle him into the backhoe. Guys, it's gonna be okay. Dazzo was able to position himself where he could hand no, no, off no, 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 no. each child to us one at a time. Come on your hands, hold on your head. No, just hold wait. on, hold on to two of us. Grab his hand. All right. Two of us at one time. All right, here we go. go. Yay, very right. good. Then we were finally able to get uh, the dad, Dazzo, onto the bucket. All right, very good. On, everybody, hold on. Hold on tight. Incredibly, without any training or rescue experience, these four men, along with the big rig operator, came to the rescue and saved the lives of Dazzle's family. 
Once everybody was safely in the bucket, these everyday heroes escorted Dazzo and his family to the awaiting firefighters and EMTs. It was one of the most joyous moments of my life. I think when it finally hit me was when we were back at our cars and I had to pull over and uh, kind of gather myself because I was shaking. Didn't realize what kind of situation we were in and it was all hitting me at once. I just remember the first time I viewed the video, just a flood of emotions I didn't even know I had. And, uh, but it was happy, but just like, wow. For their heroic efforts, the Pennsylvania House of Representatives presented the men with a citation of bravery. It was pretty awesome to get something like that and, and to know that you're in the history books. Dazzo and his family recently had the opportunity to meet back up with the men who saved their lives that August day. You guys was the hero for that day. All my family, brother, sister, grandma, everybody, we can't stop saying thanks to you guys. And you did an excellent job. So that's why I say initially you were the you were the first hero on scene as a father. You did an excellent job. None of us could have done any of that without all of us. Yes. And you were a huge, huge part of, of that, all of it. It was tough, but thank God you guys came around and saved everybody else. Everybody's fine. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I mean, I haven't seen those guys that never in my life. That was the first time. We all from different directions. We all from different country. And it was just a great experience. You experience something like that, and not to be affected is, is impossible. One of the biggest things for me is I have new family members. I have new friends. It's definitely changed my life in a good way. Coming up, firefighters rush to save a two-century-old church. You can see smoke coming from the top of the steeple. By the way, I was thinking, oh, no. When a fire breaks out, priority number one for first responders is to save lives, of course, but they also have to save property. But when a historic church went up in flames in 2020, firefighters weren't just saving a building, they were saving the town's very own history. Newburgh, New York is located on the Hudson River about 60 miles north of Manhattan. From its Victorian neighborhoods to its centuries-old architecture, it's a town steeped in American history. The city of Newburgh is an incredible collection of buildings, houses that were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it's just an intriguing place to live as you drive down every street and see beautiful houses with architecture from days gone by. Well, the city of Newburgh was one of the stops for General Washington during the American Revolution. He lived in the Hasbrook House. This was a jewel of the Hudson River for many years. Even Newburgh's fire department reaches way back in time. The fire department itself has been around for over 200 years, so the city itself and the fire department has a very long history. In fact, the fire department still uses old-time pole boxes that are located throughout the town to alert them whenever there's an emergency. The box alarm system was the way that 100 years ago people were able to notify the fire department of a fire in their area. And basically, it's a telegraph system that when you pull the hook, it notifies the fire department. When that alarm comes in, that number is placed on a ticker tape. We're able to read that tape and know which box it is, and we're able to respond there. But when it comes to history and architecture, the city's true centerpiece is the Calvary Presbyterian Church. It's a beautiful cathedral that was constructed pre-Civil War. In 1884, Thomas Edison installed lights on the top of all these columns, and it was to show investors about this new invention called electric light. And they still actually have two rings of lights that, that are there representatively to show people what that would have looked like back in the day. Being a hub of both worship and charitable outreach, the Calvary Church has always been an important fixture in Newburgh. We have been a church that has been very much a part of the community, but I think over the last several years, we've extended ourselves beyond the threshold of the doors. This church is more than just a building to the community. It's an icon representative of their vast and incredible history. Without it, much of their history could be lost forever.
At around midnight on March 4th, 2020, firefighters got the call. The church was on fire. So I pulled up on the scene. I saw a heavy fire in the rear of the church on the north side of the newer section of the church. We could see smoke coming from the top of the steeple. And I could see the fire coming through the roof at the rear of the church. Coming up, the fate of the Calvary Church is in the hands of heroic firefighters. We needed to put it out before we lost the most historic portion of the building. But first, another safety tip. If a fire breaks out in your home or business, do you know what to do? The rule is simple. Get out, stay out, then call 911. Also yell fire to alert others of the danger. Get away from it fast. Fire doubles in size every two minutes. Make it a habit to remember those simple steps because a simple routine could mean the difference between having gratitude or having regret. Around midnight on March 4th, 2020, the historic Calvary Church in Newburgh, New York, went up in flames. Firefighters were immediately dispatched, and when they arrived, they knew that they had a huge job ahead of them. It's a very, very prominent church uh, throughout the community. It's been around for a very long time. With the fire already raging, they had to come up with a game plan to stop it from spreading. We had a force entry to get in, and the plan attack was to try to minimize the fire from getting into the older section of the church, the sanctuary, so that we could possibly stop and put it out before we lost the most historic portion of the building. The fact that this church was so old presented challenges for these first responders. Older buildings tend to be more flammable as the wood is older. They also tend to have void spaces and that causes the fire to spread quickly undetected. And then it's up to us to find it. Reverend J. Edward Lewis got word of the fire and rushed to the church where he met the fire captain. I see windows being broken out from the fire department. I still see uh, several fire companies outside. I said, uh, I just want to know about, you know, the status of the fire. He said, well, the fellowship hall is burning pretty, pretty uh, good, but we're trying to hold it off from the sanctuary. Firefighters fought the blaze for hours, and finally they were able to quell the flames and save the main and oldest section of the building. We were able to contain the fire for the most part in the new section of the building. Although there was some extension to the second floor, we did keep it in the one main room. Still, the damage was extensive. As I walked into the church after the fire, there was water, debris everywhere. So it was three or four inches of soggy mess with all the books and clothing. And it was obvious that there had been a great fire in that space. Many people don't realize that it's not just the flames that can cause harm to a building. Smoke damage, debris, and even the water from the fire hoses need to be cleaned up after an event like this. Our sponsor, Belfour, was brought in to take care of the cleanup and restoration. Anytime you go into a building that has had a major fire like this, it's devastating. The building is soaking wet from the firemen. It is black, it's dark, it smells. The debris is all over the floor. The team immediately got to work. We cleaned the whole church, cleaned the pews. We had to set up scaffolding, clean the roof system, the trusses, and then we started on the reconstruction of the fellowship hall. There was a silver lining to the tragedy. The Calvary Church is not only being restored, it's also being updated and modernized. All of the lights in this space have been replaced with LED bulbs so that we can be brighter and dimmable and much more energy conscious. And we're realizing that we can provide Wi-Fi through the building, which was unheard of when the building was built. So we will be technologically up to date as we uh, find a way to provide resources to the community. There is something of the blessing, there's a blessing that will come out of the, the ashes. And I, I firmly believe that. The fact that the firefighters were able to rescue this historic landmark was a blessing in itself. I spoke to the fire chief and said, what we want to do when we come back to worship, we want to have a day of honor for firefighters. And uh, I, I think I saw tears come to his eyes. Talk about heroes. <laughs> To me, that term's overused, but when you're a fireman going into a burning building, 
you're a hero. Facing any disaster can be trying and an emotional experience. But in the events that we've seen today, we also often get a real crash course in gratitude, seeing the best in people, even if they are complete strangers. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.